Now, where we're at today, uh, what we're doing now is today I'm going to take you into my world a little bit, uh, the first part of it, and then we're also going to do some stuff with this Siemens data or this T&E data. I'm going to take you in, into my world a little bit. The first part of it is going to be the internal control system that we use at Siemens. I'm going to show you how we do it and why we do it. And some of that's going to ring real true to you in terms of, uh, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and some of these kind of things that you're, that you're going to be doing, especially you that are going to work for firms. You're going to be doing what I'm going to show you. The first part is exactly what you're going to be doing, the top-down approach, Sarbanes-Oxley, 302, 404, all that kind of stuff. So that will be a good review, too, of your first auditing class. The second part is going to be on enterprise risk management, which is my favorite part of my job. I get to do uh, stuff in looking at what are the risks and the opportunities that Siemens has in the world uh, and how do we leverage uh, opportunities and mitigate risks. So that's things like disruptive technologies that are coming, such as 3D printing and decentralized energy and unconventional gas and those kind of things, and risks like doing business with Iran uh, and sanctioned companies and competition and all these kind of things. And the reason I want to show you that is because I want to show you how the same technologies that we're talking about can be applied to uh, risk management things, to getting things done in your business, to achieving your business goals. And I'm going to teach you that all risk and all controls have to be linked to business objectives in some way. Otherwise, we shouldn't have them. We shouldn't be doing them. Okay? Um, I did a review of the, uh, of the uh, book here. By the way, I'd like everyone to get name tags out, please. Okay? And, uh, and I, I, we had Chapter 5 for the reading today. I went through it. It wasn't a whole lot of things in there, but a couple things I just want to point out to you from Chapter 5. Um, that, that might be, you know, of interest to you here and could be on the test at some point. But um, one of it is, uh, is uh, getting the data, okay? And one of the things when you go out into your jobs and you go out into the business world or you go out in the firms, you, one of the challenges you're going to have is getting data. So if it's with the firms, the clients aren't going to want to give you data. They're going to say, you know, hey, uh, this is our private data. But the truth is, in the firms as an auditor, you should have access to the data because you have a contract with these companies and you are their external auditor and you're signing an attestation at the end of the year, so you should absolutely have access to their data and you should insist on that. Okay? So for example, at Siemens, I give access to uh, Ernst & Young for, uh, to get on our computer system to look at what they need to look at to do their audits and it creates efficiencies as well. Okay? But uh, often, and then within a company, you know, IT will often say to you, well, you know, we can't give you that data. You're just, you know, an auditor or you're just, you know, you don't have any right to, or you're going to screw it up or you're going to screw up our system. And that's not, that's not the fact either. What, what the IT people need to do is they need to deliver you what we call normalized data, data that is, is cleansed and, and, and ready to write your analytics with. So if they have five systems that they're getting company name from, and in one system it's C-O-M-P-A-N-Y, company na name, and in another one it's uh, C-O-M dot name, they want to normalize, means we put those two together and we know that that's company name. So when I'm writing an analytic and I put in company name equals this, it doesn't matter that it's listed differently in another system. That's this idea of normalization, okay? So, so it's really important that you insist on getting data because otherwise you're going to be doing manually, uh, you know, the old manual way that we're talking about here that we're advocating to get away from, okay? So that was one of the things that the book talked about. Um, it, al it also talked about, uh, you know, what you're going to find is when you do get this data, you're going to find that the data that we're using today, using our statistical sample, non-statistical sampling methods and other things, it's not clean. You're going to find, when you start running this technology, you're going to find all kinds of problems with the data and that the data has problems. So we're using data that has problems. And until you start using this kind of technology, you're never going to clean the data up. So your first step might be just, and I'm not talking about fraud in the data. I'm just talking about data that's wrong because there's no one really checking it. We're not, we're not doing population checks and validations of data. So, so chapter five talks about some of those things, but I want you to be sure that you never let the availability of data get in the way of you using this technology, okay? Because that shouldn't be the case. And IT 
is just a provider, a governance owner of the technology of providing you with the data. Okay? Does that make sense? Are you clear on that? That's something in the book that, that, that might be interesting to you. Okay? Um, by the way, does everybody have, because when we get to the exercise later on, we're going to split into groups, and I want to do groups of about five people. Do, do, do we all have groups already that you're using for your homework projects pretty much? Okay, okay, we'll, we'll break out. And I don't care if you're cross-class or, or whatever here. So, Tiff, do we have the clicker thing working? The, the clicker? Uh, do you have that or does Professor Lou have that? Okay. Then what I'd like you to do, if you would, is just set, set up a sheet, just an attendance sheet, and we'll send it around. We're not going to use the clickers because uh, Professor Lou has the... Uh, has the clicker thing, and I don't have it, uh, another one. So, Okay, so just to bring you up to date on where we're going to go here, okay, is uh, we started out talking about why we need to do this. We brought in uh, the big four and how they're using analytics and technology. We introduced this idea of big data, which is going to be big in the future, and you're going to hear more about this, and you're going to be doing more of this kind of thing. Um, we brought in some of the software. So far, you've seen ACL. We're going to do more with Oversight today, uh, which I think is really interesting because it's cloud-based and it's uh, got a different model, this on-demand model. And uh, then today, I'm going to take you, uh, we heard from IBM and some of the things they're doing. I'm going to take you through my life here a little bit, okay? And then uh, next uh, class, so we don't have a class on July 4th. Everyone clear about that? Unless you want to have a special one, we could do that. No. Um, and, uh, but we will then pick up again on, uh, I guess it's 710 there, okay? So, um, so and, then, and then we're going to have, I'd like you to see how industry is doing some of this stuff, not just Siemens, but other companies. So we're going to have a really interesting speaker from Lockheed Martin, and they're doing some interesting things with technology to get at foreign corrupt practices to deal with corruption. He's going to talk about that and some other things they're doing. And while they're here, I'm going to be doing some benchmarking with them between our two companies. We work together on some of this stuff, okay? So you see where we're going here. Then we're going to get into some things like fraud and XBRL technology and some other things. So to kind of bring this together for you, okay? I want you to kind of see where we're going. And in part, I want you to see that because when the exam, for the exam, it's going to be, as I said, your ability to think critically about these concepts, okay? not just tactically about questions, but how, how do these concepts work? Why would I use this technology? What are the issues why we don't use this technology? How does XBRL fit into it? Uh, you know, how are the big four using this technology? That kind of thing. But again, my ultimate goal is that you guys become the agents of change here, okay? And that's what I'm hoping for in the future so I can retire in peace and uh, enjoy life. Now, um, okay, so why don't we get started? So first I'm gonna take you through um, the uh, internal control system, which is really the control system that most of you, if you become all on the audit side, you're going to be doing in the, in the environment. So, and I'm going to show you why we at Siemens took this approach. We have probably a benchmark approach, but sadly it's because we had some real problems, okay? So um, I'll let, first let me show you my little uh, risk video. There's always, there's always risk in life here. Fortunately, I couldn't get the sound to work. But um, I'll, I'll narrate for you if I can get this to come up here. Let's see. Yeah, so this is an actual photograph of some guys that got all set, and they went out to uh, go kayaking, and everything was going great. And they were having a great time. They had all their risks mitigated. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this is an actual picture from a fishing boat. A, a, an orca whale landed on top of this guy. Do you think he's coming back up again? Sad day. No, he actually did come back up again. This was from a Korean fishing boat, and this guy survived. <laughs> Can you imagine? So sometimes you have risks and you make it through, and other times you don't. But what, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about risks, okay? So, um, so I'm going to take you through, I, I mentioned that already, the internal control structure at Siemens, uh, our Sarbanes-Oxley. Everyone knows what Sarbanes-Oxley is from your accounting classes? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's something you're going to be really intimately involved in in the auditing for, okay? So, uh, since you know, why don't you tell me, what is Sarbanes-Oxley? It's signed by President Bush in 2002 to create accountability because of what? Enron, WorldCom, and these other things, okay? 
And interestingly, it applies to who? Who does it apply to? Sarbanes-Oxley. Does it apply to Joe's Pizza Place in Newark here? Yeah, listed, listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange, okay? So interestingly, my company, we're delisting from the stock exchange. We just de uh, applied for the delisting, and we're going to be uh, 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 deregistering, -regist which means we don't have to do t uh, 20 Fs in our case, t equivalent of 10 Ks, because we're, uh, we're getting off the stock exchange. The only reason we're doing it, though, we still have to do, that's interesting, we still have to do basically Sarbanes-Oxley because German Commercial Code and the FTSE and other s exchanges that we trade on have the same kind of rules. Okay, so, uh, uh, but uh, that, that's an interesting process. We're doing it because our ADRs, the, the, the stock we trade, is only 5% traded on the New York Stock Exchange for Siemens, even though it's a $100 billion company, and the balance is traded over the counter or, uh, you know, on other exchanges. So, um, okay, and enterprise risk management, anyone know what that is? Well, I told you a minute ago, but it's basically the idea of we, we're looking at our risk and we're going to begin to manage our risks. And the enterprise risks are the risks that aren't covered by the internal control system, okay? So in 2008, Siemens, uh, the Department of Justice uh, found Siemens guilty of violation of internal controls, books and records for foreign corrupt practices because of briberies that were done um, in, uh, outside of the U.S. anyway. And interestingly, you know, it was a, a, a cultural problem because we had, you know, in 1999, you could take a tax deduction for bribery in Europe. You could, you could, you could bribe someone and, and write off your, your expenses for the bribery in, in, in Europe. Um, we got uh, about an $800 million fine from the SEC and DOJ and another $800 million or so from the German uh, regulators, total of $1.6 billion for corruption, okay? And some of you, you know, you know in many countries there's still a lot of corruption going on. It's got to stop. Com countries that allow corruption have a 17% lower GDP than countries that don't. So corruption's a serious issue. And if you want to find corruption, you better use technology because you're not going to find it by taking non-statistical samples and 4i principles, okay? So that's another reason that we want to do this. So. Um, we, uh, because of that, we got a, uh, in addition to the fine, uh, we got a, a German uh, 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 compliance monitor for four years that brought a whole staff in on our nickel, and we had to pay to have this guy monitor to make sure we were doing things right. Fortunately, we got a clean bill of health from that, and we put in probably one of the best internal control and enterprise risk management systems around because, because of that. Now, it's unfortunate that we had to go through that to get there, okay? This is our former CF, uh, CEO, uh, Peter Loescher, but he said at the time, and that's still the statement in Siemens, is we have zero tolerance for, uh, you know, compliance is our number one priority, and we have zero tolerance for, you know, uh, corruption or doing things wrong. And, and, and what happened was, uh, you know, uh, we, we've decided now we're not doing any business in countries or, or, or taking any business that requires any type of bribery or any type of corruption in order to do it. And yet what happens is most people, and, and you know, interestingly, we didn't get fined for the corruption, really, for, for the books and records. We got fined for not having an integrated, sustainable internal control process to detect it. Okay? And, and, and uh, that, that's what we actually got the fine for. And uh, what we learned is that, you know, we are not, we're just not going to do business. And we thought our business was going to go way down because countries in wherever, Nigeria, Venezuela, or wherever, where you have to bribe people to get things done, we're going to lose all that business. When in effect, what ended up happening is we gained more business, you know. So it's, it's, it's good business to do the right thing, you know. Okay? Um, now, I want to explain this to you because this is important. This is, uh, if you think about a company, and this, what, what, the reason this is important is because when you guys go into the firms or something in accounting and auditing, you're only seeing a, a part of the picture, okay? You're only seeing that control environment. I want you to see the whole picture here and understand how what we're talking about applies to every, every area of business, okay? So in any business or any organization, I have a gross risk here, okay? That's risks to my business. That's things that could go wrong. 
It's things that are going to prevent me from achieving my five objectives, which are maybe growth and profitability and cost reduction and compliance and maybe a few others, okay? And by the way, in any company, you should be sure that you can define on five fingers what are the key objectives of that company because you only have risks and you only need controls relative to uh, uh, re relative objectives in your country. And then we put in the internal control system, and that's what all of you are going to go out and audit. You're going to go into companies. You're not going to be auditing their risk management for the most part. You're going to be going in and going through and doing all this sampling of controls to find out if this company has good controls. Okay? And, and that reduces your risk somewhat because you're addressing controls, either with automation or without. Okay? And then what you have is a net risk. You have some risk that you don't have controls for. Okay? And these could be strategic things, operational things, financial things, or regulatory compliance things that you don't have controls in place. And that, this is where enterprise risk management comes in. It mitigates the risks that you don't have controls for, and it addresses those risks here, okay? And then, and it does it, it can do it by, you can address risk by avoiding risk, by reducing risk, by taking steps, putting controls in. You can do it by transferring risk. How do you do that? Like an insurance company, right? I say, I'm going to insure against this risk, okay? Or by just accepting the risk. And by the way, risk is not a bad thing. You want to take risks. If you don't take risks, you're not going to prosper. I think I shared with you in the first class there that, you know, Kodak was fantastic and they, they, they were a well-managed and operated company and this thing called digital film that they helped invent came along and they didn't want to take too much risk in investing in it, okay? And they thought that the adoption of it was going to be linear and instead it was more like a hockey stick and they missed the boat and they filed for bankruptcy last or two years ago whatever because they missed the boat so take so if you don't take risks you're not going to do anything you're not going to go anywhere just like your careers if you guys don't you're at a great stage in your careers to take a little risk because you don't most of you probably don't have five kids and a and a mortgage and, and and everything you know so so this is a good time in life to take some risks and that includes in promoting this technology and moving up in your in your company and in, in your job it's a good time a good time in your lives to take some risks so risk is not bad but we want to manage risk 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 has to be managed okay so I want you to see this picture because this is important that we got the only reason we do all this control stuff is because we have risks and we're going to mitigate those risks with internal controls. We're going to mitigate them further with enterprise risk management. And some risks we're not going to mitigate at all. And some risks we're going to take. Okay, that's important. All right. So what we did at Siemens, and again, I'm just taking you into our world a little bit in one multinational corporation. There's other other companies that do different things. But what we did is we said we got to get this right. We are going to only do clean business. No if ends or buts. We're just going to not. We're going we're to put in a, a robust internal control system, and we started with the end and said, okay, at the end of the day, even though we have an attestation from our external auditors, we're going to have an internal attestation that said that that every CFO and CEO within our company is going to sign off on, and there, that's going to include the reliability of financial reporting, which is Sarbanes Oxley the compliance with external laws and regu regulations in every area and that includes FDA in the medical field it includes engineering requirements it includes uh, EPA it includes any any regulatory body PCAOB well they regulate the firms but any 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 regulations that we have and there's all kinds of regulations you know OSHA regulations for safety we're saying we are going to make sure every CFO and CEO signs on the dotted line that all of that this is in compliance. Safeguarding Siemens ass assets, that's our business conduct guidelines that every employee's got to follow. And then compliance with internal requirements, that's policies and stuff. So that, that was the, this was the end game that we wanted to have not, and we don't have to do this. Sarbanes-Oxley just says that you got to sign off under uh, 302, your, the head of your company. But we said we're going to have everyone sign off because we're going to get this right, okay? So uh, what we did then is we had one final in control statement, but we had that uh, uh, every division, business unit, and sector sign off, and then that rolled into here. And anybody who signed that thing was liable in the company for what they were signing, that the controls were in, in place and, and working effectively. 
And then we designed a, a risk and internal control organization, which I'm a part of. I'm responsible for, the, for North America here. And, and we put in leadership that covered the whole world. And we did it all the same way. See, before, we had some really good internal controls in the U.S. and some other places, but it was all decentralized. So we, nobody was doing everything the same. And that's important that you have the same processes when you're addressing controls, okay? So we put in an organization that covered the whole world for Siemens. We do business in 190 countries and have 370,000 employees and $110 billion. So, you know, it, we, and it's great if one group is doing a great job, but the other group over in wherever is not doing such a good job, you know, that's, that's not consistent. And that's really why we got the fine, because we didn't have a consistent process. It wasn't that we weren't doing anything, it's that we weren't consistent in it, okay? All right, and then I have an organization that covers all of our industries in energy, healthcare industry, uh, Canada, Mexico and the US, okay? And then I'm, I'm responsible for making sure that the internal control system is working and, this, and I have to go and get signatures from all of the leadership in the company on this internal control system. This is just my organization here in the US or, or in North America, so, okay? Um, and then I said, you know, we, we link it. These are just examples of a multi-corporation's goals. We, we start this process by starting with goals. So goals are things like growth, people development, reputation, cost, and services, okay? So you don't have risks, important point to self, don't have risks or controls needed unless you link them to business objectives. Otherwise, you might be mitigating a risk that has nothing to do with your business, okay? Now, we all have to follow financial reporting guidelines, right? So that, that's, that's a requirement, but that's part of our goal is to be compliant, you know. Okay, so uh, I was gonna do a clicker question on this, but we should only have controls that they support one of these key objectives, true or false. Class, true, true, okay, very good. You guys are really smart. Okay, so then what we did is we said, okay, we're going to have controls not just over financial reporting, and that's what I want you to understand, is especially when you think about this technology, this technology is not just applied to financial reporting. It applies to any control environment, okay? So I want you to get that. That's, that's important. But what we did is we said everything we do is either strategic, things like corporate governance, internal audit, strategy and planning. Those are strategic things. Or it's operational customer relations, CRM, customer relations management, project management, supply chain, product life cycle management, that's the introduction of products and how you do them. Or it's financial, and this is the stuff most of you are studying right now, but it's only one of the, one of the things that goes on in a company. And that's treasury investment management, accounting and financial reporting, controlling tax, capital structure. Or it's compliance, okay? That's anti-bribery, anti-fraud, and we, we think of compliance at Siemens as regulatory compliance, something where there's an external regulator is going to ding you if you don't do it well, okay? And so these are all these categories. And what we basically said is there's nothing we do in this company that isn't linked to one of these things, okay? And if you can think of anything that we do that's not, that you're doing that's not linked to one of these, we're either going to add a new one or, 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 or change the wording or something, okay? And I want you to understand this. This is important, too, is that... Um, if you look at value loss in companies or where risk is, we always think, oh, we want to have all these financial controls. But you know, the value loss in a company of financial is only about 15%. So if you take what's at risk in a company, it's strategic things and operational things that make up over 75% of the value loss in a company. So the most important place to have controls isn't just financial controls. And I'm sharing this with you because a lot of you going into, into the firms, you're going to just, you're going to be, if you're on the audit side, if you're on the advisory side, you'll get into some of these things. But if you're on the audit side, you're going to be just looking at financial reporting controls. And that, they're important. But that's not the, that's not the world you're going to be managing, really. And that's not how you're going to apply this technology. And you need to have controls across all of them, okay? That's, that's what I want you to understand. So this is where the value loss comes in. Compliance is another 7%. So we spend a lot of time worrying about how uh, that our financial reporting is right, but that's not where the biggest risk to the company is. If you screw up on competitor issues and major processes and projects, you know, at Siemens we've had like $4 billion of restatements on, uh, or not restatements, but earnings warnings on projects. 
but running projects well. Much bigger than anything that's ever happened for something we've reported wrong in on the financial statements, you know. Okay? Any questions? Everyone clear on that? That's an important point, all right? Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, uh, these would be, you know, just questions to think about. Can you think of anything that happens in an organization that wouldn't fall under one of those categories? Can you think of any business process that, that, that wouldn't fall under one of those strategic, operational, financial, or compliance processes? And then, you know, uh, how would you develop automated controls that could address strategic and operational risks? So, for example, you know, let's take, uh, let's take, uh, you know, uh, competitor infringement, okay? We could use analytics to analyze uh, big data out there wherever we see our, one, put one of our six major competitors in and we could review press and stuff to find out about patent activity that they're doing. And we could do analysis on that. We can measure certain metrics off of financial statements of our company versus other companies. So, you know, there's nothing, any, remember that what we're learning in this class is anything you can write uh, pseudocode for, if this, then that, and you have access to the internet and, and, and to your internal docu records, documents, to big data that we talked about, you can write analytics. So you can have controls to monitor uh, what's going on in your business. I, I shared the example once before. Um, uh, receivables over 30 days, okay? I can set up something that monitors any receivables. If I see a receivable that's over 30 days, that's more than $5,000 or $10,000 or whatever threshold you want to do, I want to send an alert to the audit department because it's a control issue, and I also want to send an alert to the, uh, the salesman that's responsible for collecting that receivable. And what am I doing then? I'm managing with analytics my cash flow because now I'm going to collect it. Instead, what we end up doing is we find out at the end of the month or the end of the quarter that our cash flow sucks and that we've got too many outstanding receivables or any other input to cash flow, and, and we, we know it's, it's after the fact. We find out, and then we all race around and try and do something about it, but we don't have data to do it. We can put in, a, if you will, a preventative control to prevent it. Okay? So any of these sort of strategic things, uh, you know, margin pressure. What are our margins doing? Monitor sales margins. Monitor credit on a continuous basis. Whatever those, whatever those drivers are of risk around strategy and operational, we put analytics on that. And I'm going to show you later how we're going to put analytics on enterprise risk management so we can manage our risks. Um, GE, for example, does a great job of this. They have about 81 analytics that they monitor on a continuous basis, and they know whether their risks are going up or down, or they know if they're not taking enough risks. They look at their metrics and say, you know what, we have a growth objective, an opportunity for growth, and we're not growing like we should be. We're not taking advantage of opportunities. We're not taking enough risk, so we got to take more risk, and they find that out from analytics. Okay, So that's one of the myths is that, the biggest risk, you know, the biggest problems a company has is financial, and that's not true. It's strategy and operations. You can be a great uh, financial company and go under, okay? So, okay, so what we did then is we decided to kind of have three things going on here. Again, this all came from this corruption thing. We, we decided we're going to do this right, and we're going to do this the best way, and we got, you know, Deloitte and Touche and other consulting firms in and went after this, okay? So what we decided is we were going to have uh, a, a single source for every company of a, of, a, of a control book, basically, a policy and control master book, PCMB. And that has every control that every company in Siemens has to have and has to follow, and it covers all those four areas. And then we decided to assess the achievement of the control requirements and monitor all those controls in all companies. Now, just get this. We have over a thousand companies that we consolidate. These are wholly owned subsidiary or wholly owned companies. And then we have multiple, many investments that we're a minority holder in. So we've got a thousand companies that have sub-companies to them that we're managing and consolidating every, every month. Can you imagine pulling all that together? You know? I started with Siemens as a consultant in SAP in that legal consolidation and management reporting, and it was so complex. I mean, it's one thing to close the books for your company. But to close the books for, you know, a thousand companies, 
all in one month and roll it all up under U.S. GAAP now and for us under IFRS is complicated. And you can't do it manually. You know, I mean, well, you can do it manually, but you're going to have problems, you know. And then we had this final, finally, this, uh, this uh, in control statement, okay? So, so that was the three sort of components. This is a schedule that I use personally. This is my project plan for the year. And I move this blue line across, and I have the PCMB, which is all our controls. I have my Sarbanes-Oxley, my 302, and down below I have Enterprise Risk Management. And we have all these tasks that have to be completed for North America here, for every company in every country in North America. But my counterpart over in Africa or Middle East, they're doing the exact same thing. They've got the same things they've got to do. So we're doing this as a, an integrated process, okay? So let's talk about SOA. Now, this is important from your first auditing class and, and the second on class. The approach we're taking for Sarbanes-Oxley under AS5, which was the pronouncement of risk-based approach, is the top-down approach, okay? So what we do is we start, this, and this happens every year. You know, you guys will be the ones coming out and doing this for us. Uh, you guys come out and you say, okay, I want to see all your significant accounts. So any accounts that have a balance of over uh, X amount, I don't know, $15 million, $7 million, or ha have activity of more than seven or $15 million. So this is how we're gonna get to our control environment. And you gotta know this, because if you're in the firms, this is what you're gonna be doing, okay? And then we uh, define uh, the, multi, uh, the locations that are impacted by the, that account, and we define the processes that, that are relative to that account, the related processes. So is it accounts payable, accounts receivable? Uh, is it uh, financial close? You know, what's the process that is affected by that significant account, okay? So if I have accounts receivable, it's the order to cash process. That's the process that's in scope now, okay? And then I wanna look at, you know, in those, and, and we also look at what are the key systems you know, SAP systems and other things that, that, that support that account. Then I, then I say to myself, okay, now, what could go wrong in this process? How could someone steal money from the company? How could someone misstate earnings? How could someone screw up a provision or do something wrong, okay? And then we, we set up what we call key controls, and the key controls are the things that we're gonna use to address those risks, okay? So this is the, the process that you use for Sarbanes-Oxley, okay, and, and, and you're going to go through, and that's how you identify your key controls, okay. So I have a threshold for significant accounts, I have key processes and key systems, and then I develop key controls, all right. Now, what's wrong with that? That sounds like a good process. I'm going to take every account over that has more than $15 million in it, and I'm going to uh, look at the processes that affect that. I'm going to ask, you know, what could go wrong, and then I'm going to set up key controls. What, what's a what's a problem with that? Anybody? Can anybody help me out? Yeah. Exactly, James. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what am what am I going to say? Hey. You know, they're only checking accounts over 15 million, so I'm going to go to this T&E account that's only 10 million, and I'm going to do my fraud there. So, 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 so that's a risk. And sometimes they do, in fairness, they do do a wild card type thing, and they'll pick something else, you know. So, um, you know, but, but that's the approach we use. And again, back to my initial introduction to this topic, that's another frailty of this whole thing, is that we're, you know, we're not just doing non-statistical sampling, we're jumping around looking at this stuff. Yes. every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one account might be in one year, not in the other, and that doesn't mean it's not an opportunity for some type of fraud. Is that what you mean, the materiality? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any other ideas? Are we covering everything? No, right? We're not covering everything. We're only going to get some sample of it. It's back to this sort of, you know, non-statistical sampling approach, okay? All right, so all right, and then uh, very important IT controls, okay? I said we look at not just important processes, but important systems, too. And in, in IT, there's two basic types, well, there's four basic types. The, the, the company-level controls are just that you have a governance process over your organization, and they're important. But this idea of IT general controls, okay? And this is true for any significant 
system for financial reporting under SOA. And what it says basically is, if I have an IT system, I got to make sure that change management, that access sec and security is, is locked down, change management is locked down, systems development is locked down, and the data center is locked down. Because if I'm a DBA and I can go into the data center and I can change anything, then you know I, I have no. It doesn't matter what else you do. Think about this: if I have uh, super user access to SAP, and by the way, we, we find when we go in and audit co uh, companies often, and you'll see this in the firms, you'll have 73 people with super user access. If I have super user access to SAP, I can take the the sense, I, I can write an ABAP program, and I can say. At 3 o'clock in the morning, every morning, I'd like you to take the cents off of every, just the pennies, off of every uh, accounts payable transaction, and I'd like you to transfer it to an e-commerce account in my name in Geneva, Switzerland, and, then I'd and I'd like you to turn off the security logs, and then I'd like you to turn back on the security logs at the end of the, at the, uh, you know, at, the end, at 3 o'clock and erase all the records of everything I did, and then run it again tomorrow. And you know what? We, you will never find that unless you have technology. You know, you, you, you won't find that. And you could steal money left and right. And, and that's often what happens. And they're usually good IT people that do it, but you don't even need to be that savvy to do it because it's not that hard to do in SAP. It's like writing in Visual Basic, you know, writing the, the code. So it's really important that these IT general controls are locked down, okay? And if they are, then the other category we have is IT application controls. And these are like system parameter controls. So for example, an IT application control would be, you know, that you have a duplicate invoice check in SAP that it's turned on. Because it's great if you have that, but if it's not turned on. So, and, and that's usually a test of one in Sarbanes-Oxley because it's either turned on or it's not. We don't have to do a bunch of sampling. If I have the duplicate invoice check, then it's SAP's going to check to make sure I never have a duplicate invoice check, okay? So, and what we do is we allow you with IT general controls to, if these are locked down, we allow you to do what's called benchmarking. We do this with Ernst & Young to benchmark the application controls. Because theoretically, if my change management is solid, only the right people have access to the system, the data center is locked down, and system development is done only with approvals, then no one can change the, the, the uh, duplicate invoice check key. So they'll let you benchmark, and that means you can go three years without doing a test of these, of these IT application controls, okay? So, um, and, and I don't know if you know the way this works, but in any system, you have uh, three basic categories. You have the development group, you have the test and quality group, and then you have the production group. And you should never have anybody in the, in the development group that is also in the production group, because then they could change things. And, and, and then you transport. You, you do something new. You change it in the development thing. You test it. And then you move it into production. And that process has to have approvals along the way. Otherwise, someone could screw, screw something up. And the technologies that we're you, teaching you in this class, oversight and, and uh, ACL and IDEA, they need to be accredited this way too, because if you have a system that's checking your controls in an automated way and it's not secure, then you don't have any control, you know, because then I can go in and, and, and change something, okay? And then you have manual IT dependent controls. Those are things like I get a report out of the system and then I check my report and then I make decisions based on my report, okay? So, okay, uh, how do ITAC controls or automated controls provide a, a better level of precision? What, what, what are they? They're what? Automated controls, right? Okay, you got that? This is, this is what we're saying here, is the, that these are much, these, in, these uh, IT application controls that, because when you turn on the, the, the uh, duplicate invoice check in SAP, it doesn't take a sample. It checks every one. And if there's a problem, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to find it. Now, there's one exception to that that's kind of interesting that some of this technology like Oversight has, and that's this idea. Anyone know what fuzzy logic is? Anybody ever heard of fuzzy logic? Okay. So I have a I have a duplicate invoice check. Do you guys do everyone have name tags? I want to make sure I get Courtney, right? I got you, yeah. Okay. Um, fuzzy logic check is this kind of thing. I may have a number, and this actually happened to me at Siemens once, uh, where, or not to me, but we, we found it, where someone had a they were doing automatic automatic invoicing, and they took an invoice and it had number 
138064. Uh, and they put it on a fax machine and they faxed it in. And then someone else found it again and they, uh, they put it on the machine and they had it over a little bit and the one, it, it said 38074, it cut off the one, okay? And everything else on it was the same except the number was a little different because the first letter got cut off. And what fuzzy logic is, is a technology that says, you know, let's check three or four things in here and let's check numbers that are similar but not exactly the same. And, and we can find, you know, uh, where we have a discrepancy or a problem. That's, that's called fuzzy logic. And, that's, and good softwares have the ability to do fuzzy logic as well because you're never, you're not always going to have a perfect number or a perfect match and you wanna, might want to match on multiple fields, okay? But anyway, on ITAC, what's it, what it's doing is it's, it's checking every invoice. So every invoice, all the time, no matter what it is, it's making sure that the, or that the number is the same, okay? I mean, or that, the, that we don't have a duplicate invoice number, okay? All right, so then what we did is we said, okay, if we have problems uh, with our controls, we're gonna prioritize the deficiencies. So, and we're gonna do it, uh, and I want you to notice here when we get to enterprise risk management, we use the same type of approach. We're not just gonna look at the, uh, the priority in terms of financial risk, but also business objectives. That means, am I gonna achieve a business objective or not? Because there might be something that has very little financial impact that I can calculate, but it's gonna affect my ability to grow my company to meet certain targets. We're gonna look at regulatory risk, okay? If you have, anyone know what conflict minerals are? Yeah, what are conflict minerals? Yeah, yeah, human rights violations. Very good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this is a big issue. But when you look at it, you say to yourself, you know, if we were, if we had a regulatory problem, and this is in the Congo, the, 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 the Republic of the Congo, where they're abusing people, okay? Now you may say to yourself, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm Siemens, I buy, and that's uh, tin, uh, tallium, uh, gold, and a couple other things. But uh, what they do is they abuse people over there. So, and this is a big regulatory issue. And under Dodd-Frank, if you study Dodd-Frank now, it's required to report on that for the SEC now too, okay? And, but the risk there is that it's not a big financial risk, but let me tell you, if uh, 12 people show up in front of your office in Washington, D.C. with signs that say Siemens is abusing you know, human rights in the Congo, you got a problem. And you can't put a net income before tax thing on that, but you might be out of business in no time. So that, that's, a, that's a, a, a regulatory and it's a media or reputational risk. So think about how companies manage risks. You know, I told you before, whistleblowers, people that call out fraud in companies, 75% of them lose their jobs, you know? And most of them are never investigated or reported. We'll cover that when we get to fraud. And the reason is people don't want this media and reputational stuff because that's worse than that's worse than having to restate your earnings. It could be worse than having to restate your earnings. And then management time. So if we have a deficiency or a or an issue that's taking a lot of management time, we calculate the risk there. So what we do then is this is the description, and then we have a priority. So a pri on a, on net income before tax, the priority if it's it's a priority three if it's less than ten million dollar impact. If it's 10 to 20 million, it's a priority two, and if it's over 20 million, it's a priority one, okay? Or if the control deficiency results in an investigation by external authorities, regulatory bodies, and costly legal action, that's a priority one too, even though it, we, it may have very little financial impact. Do you follow that? That's important because that, those, are, those are your risks too. And again, controls are around risks, so you're gonna have controls on these things, okay? And then we also have what we call, everyone know what compensating controls are from your first class? Anybody know what compensating controls are? Think about it, compensating. You, you know, you, there's something that helps the control, okay? They're, 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 you have a key control and then you have compensating controls, okay? Okay, so, so uh, that's, that's Sarbanes-Oxley. I want you to get, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley is focused on, get this, is focused on financial reporting, that's it. Okay, it doesn't, the auditors don't come in and say, gee, how are you guys doing with your competitors or how are you doing with your, uh, 
your uh, you know internal audit group or what are you doing with this? They, they, they're interested in how does it impact my financial reporting. They're not looking at efficiency of your operation. They're not usually looking at regulatory things, okay? Although, under the SEC now, you are responsible for making sure you have and management is involved in your risk management process, and that's enterprise risk management process, and that's becoming increasingly important. So they're starting to do some auditing of the enterprise risk management process. I got audited this year on our process by Ernst & Young because they want to make sure we have a risk management process, okay? So now, just to level set here, so we talked about, um, I want to finish on the internal control process here and just checking my time here, okay? So what we did is uh, we wanted to get together all of our internal controls so we had them all together so we could manage them for everyone, okay? And what we did is we found out that we had a lot of circulars, we had SOA controls, we had business conduct guidelines, we had all these different controls, but we weren't really, they weren't all in one place and there were thousands of them and there were more in the U.S. than there were here or whatever, you know, they were all over the place and they were different in every business. So we wanted to get them all together. So we went out and we found we had some 1,500 different circulars, some of them were duplicating one another and we said, uh, you know, about 17% of them were strategic, 44% were operational, 32% financial, and 7% compliance. So we started to narrow those down, get rid of duplications, get rid of overlap, and see if we could get a book, you know, get to this sort of book here of this policy control master book. So that included all the SOA controls, the corporate circulars, the uh, company level controls, which are your broad controls. Uh, all kinds of compliance framework, task forces, business conduct guidelines, all these things. And we, we got these all together and we went through and we asked ourselves, how do these affect risk in our business? Which ones affect risk, which ones don't, all right? And then we did, we call it the sort of salami exercise, and we said, okay, you know, I have, you know, this company in our energy group here in the U.S., and it has, you know, these controls, but some of these controls are done only by the corporate people up top, um, some of them don't apply to my business because they're, say, financial services controls and I'm a discrete manufacturer, so they don't apply to me. So, and then some controls are covered by central service groups like shared services. So we narrowed it down and then you come down to a company and you say, okay, of the, you know, thousand controls or so that, that could apply, for this company only 500 of them apply or only 300 of them apply. Okay, you follow me? So that we're, we're only, we all have the same set of controls, but they don't all apply to everyone. So if there's a, a, a Basel III type control for financial services and I'm making, uh, you know, uh, turbines, or there's project level controls and I'm making, you know, uh, discrete manufacturing things, they don't apply to me. So I, I, I come down to this amount. And then we said, okay, each one of these remaining couple of controls they have some type of uh, risk level. They're either high, medium, or low. And if they're high risk controls, then we're going to do a more thorough uh, audit of them, okay, or, or a control review. If they're medium, we'll do a little less, and if they're uh, low, we'll do, we'll do less. So we came up with this concept with help from Deloitte and Touche and other consultants. And, and by the way, we use the COSO framework. COSO is the... Uh, a, f a standard framework that's used around the world. It's a top framework for con the control environment developed by the Treadway Commission, okay? You should know that because that's where a lot of the control environment comes from. And we said for those high risk controls, we're gonna do what's called a detailed assessment. And that's what many of you are gonna do when you go and work for the firms. And the detailed assessment is an independent review of the controls. So they're gonna send you out and they're gonna say, say, I want you to go out and I want you to Go and find the process owner and I want you to review the controls that they have and, uh, and independently test them. Don't, don't count on what they see and you'll do that through inquiry, through re, re, reproducing or uh, re-performing the control yourself and you're going to independently test it so that you, you, you're not the process owner. Then we, then we had another assessment level we call for less risky controls, a self-assessment. And that's where we say, James, we want you to define what you do in this process and do a write-up of it and if an auditor comes and evidence it and if an auditor comes to you you need to be able to produce this paper and show him what you do but you write it instead of me coming in and looking at it that's less risky and then we have what we call 
uh, no uh, uh, specific assessment required. And that's where I have a control that isn't real high risk, but I need to know that I'm doing something about it, and I need to be able to articulate for an auditor when, when if and when asked what I do, okay? So we, we now this, there, this isn't the only way to do this, but this is what we do at Siemens, okay? So we have these three categories, and we have less of the DAs than we do of the SAs and, less, and, 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 and more of the NSARs than any of them. But we do it all on risk. So risk is the key, okay? And again, back to that first chart, okay? So let me give you an example of a self-assessment, okay? So uh, uh, the, the assessor must rate that control it, control requirement and provide a rationale. What are the things he does, he or she does? What is it sufficient to achieve the control requirement? How is it known that the activities are working effectively? Uh, you know, what are the details and how do you evidence that you're doing it? So this would be an example. This is a financial control, okay? And it says there's a requirement that a customer credit check is undertaken and customer credit limits are defined for all customers appropriately authorized and regularly reviewed, okay? So an acceptable self-assessment would be uh, the customer credit rating and credit limit procedures are followed, the accounts receivable team has responsibility. So it's a, it's a and, and you're always going to do this in auditing. You're going to ask the questions who, what, where, and how, okay? So whenever you do a control, you should see in there who's doing it, what are they doing, how are they doing it, uh, and, wh and when, when are they doing it? How often are they doing it? Those are the questions you want to answer in any control review. And again, you guys in September, a lot of you are going to be doing this stuff, so pay attention. You know, this, is the, this is what you're going to be doing, okay? And you're going to be looking at this control, and so I'm going to look at this, and I may check the documentation to make sure that the uh, customer credit check is undertaken and the customer credit limits are defined. And Matilda, where'd she go? There she goes. Okay, so that's the self-assessment. So that's that's the the second riskiest. Uh, again, the no assessment required uh, uh, is uh, we don't we don't you don't have to write anything, but you do have to be able to say how do I make sure that credit limits are appropriately approved? Well, I we do it this way. You got to be able to articulate that. So here's a detailed assessment, and this is where all of you are going to live that go into the accounting firms. You're going to have uh, a risk for a control. You're going to have an objective. You're going to have assertions. How many know what assertions are? Do you guys know what assertions are? Help, anyone tell me an assertion. What? Existence, accuracy, completion, right? Those are the assertions. Okay, so, the, and, and this is a very, again, I got to tell you, you know, I'm not the biggest advocate of this because I don't think, like I said earlier, that we're getting at it all with this. But, so what you're going to do first is you're going to come in and you're going to test the design. Say you're going to test the design first of the control. Is this control designed to address the risk that we're talking about here? I mean, is it capable of doing that? Okay. Then you're going to you're going to so that's the test of the design. Then you're going to uh, test the effectiveness. Even if it is designed right, first of all, was it done? And if it was done, is it effective in addressing it? And was it done properly? Was it you know performed at the right time, et cetera? Okay. So let's take a look at uh, so. Here, you're, here, the key is that it's an independent review, okay? And this is the instructions for the person, and they'll hand you this in, in Ernst & Young, too. You know, read through the document, understand the key controls. And let me say this, it's really important, too. You know, when you do have a control, whether you're automating it or not, and you have a key control, that's, that's the control, okay? So just, and one of the mistakes we made with automation is we added more controls with automation and we had manual key controls, and you know people kept doing the manual control even though we put in better automated controls, and, and, and then we just start adding controls on top of controls, and all you do is create work. You're not necessarily improving the precision of the control. That's an important term, precision of control. That's how effectively is that control, the precision of it, addressing the risk and the objective of the control, that, uh, the process that we're dealing with, okay? So just adding more controls, and that's sometimes what happens with technology. The auditors say, yeah, go ahead, throw those on top. That's good. You know, go ahead and do that, and, but let's still do all this manual crap we were doing before. But throw on some more of these, and then I'll feel even better. And all you do really is create a lot of work that confuses people and doesn't necessarily add to the value. Okay? So this is what you're going to do. You're going to go in and 
you know, look at the control, where is it evidenced, et cetera, okay? Okay, so let's use an example of one, a detailed control, and this would be a higher risk control. There's a requirement that the limits of authority is executed for every customer project with a bid volume of greater than 100,000 euro and documented in the PM at Siemens LOA tool. LOA is level of authority tool, okay? So we want to make sure that, that any pro for any project that's over 100 million euro that the, uh, the, the process is executed, the, the limit authority process, in other words, the right people are approving it. Okay, so that's, that's a real important control if I'm doing a big project. It's probably a real important control if I'm doing a small project too, but, okay? So what I'm going to do here, the key control performer obtains, this is what he does, obtains a quarterly SAP report out of the system. It lists all the projects and the LLA tool. A check is then performed to verify that all existing projects in SAP which are subject to LLA process, including projects with a bid volume greater than 100, have been appropriately approved per the requirements. So it's basically, are we properly approving projects and documented. The key control performer then stores a signed protocol form in his office as evidence. So you got to be able to evidence it, okay? So that, that's, that's the, the, the key, that's the key control. This is what's going to assure that this happens, okay? So, um, so here, here is where you're, you're going to write down what you did and, or, or the third party is going to come in and make sure. So I'm going to come in and say, you know, Regina, I would like to see all of the, uh, uh, all of the approvals for every project over $100,000, or I'd like to see a sample of 10 of them or whatever. That's the traditional approach we take, okay? So now that you guys are in this class, I'd like you to tell me, how, I'd like someone in here to tell me, or, or a couple of you, tell me how would you automate that control so that we don't have to come in and do a sample. And by the way, if we come in and uh, can automate it, now we don't have to do this, you know, we can do the test of design and test of effectiveness automatically and we don't have to test anything, okay? Because the control becomes the test, right? So someone, someone help me out, just read that, tell me what you would do, yes. If project, you have a project field, amount is greater than 100,000, then uh, check uh, the approval, okay, that it was approved by, and you go to the LOA, you have an LOA level of authority that says, you know, uh, anything over 100,000, Rod Brennan has to approve, okay? Then, now you, you have to assume you have electronic approval. It assure that it's been approved by, you go out to the chart and check it, by Rod Brennan, okay? So I have a control. And now everyone that's 100, I don't have to do any sampling. I have a control that says every project, I mean, this is simple. You guys just did this in ACL. You just have, a, you just have something that says, uh, first of all, pull me, ne see, see, what they're doing is they're getting a report down. And then some poor slob it has to go through and check and go down and check everyone that's 100,000. Maybe they sort it in Excel, okay? And then they got to go out and make sure that there's a, an approval from a, 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 you know, a table that they're looking at that they print out and they're looking manually and doing this for, and let's say there's 10,000 projects like that. How, how are you going to do that? You know what you're going to do? You take a sample of 30 of 10,000 and hope you might find if there's a problem, one that hasn't been approved. If I use an analytic here, I'm just going to have the system on every project, and never mind over $100,000, let's make sure they're all right. And I'm just going to have an analytic that says, if I see any project, that's not approved by the right level thing. I'm just going out to a table and saying over 100,000 Rod Brennan has to approve, okay? And so I need to see the electronic approval, which is just a field in SAP that it's been approved by Rod Brennan, and then it's okay. And if I find one that's not, immediately send me one of my closed loop escalated alerts to tell me that it's not been approved and we've got a problem and Rod didn't approve this one. Now I have a problem and I, and I deal with that exception. The whole population, never mind only over 100,000. Now every project is going to be properly approved. And we've had issues with projects that, you know, they went awry because they weren't properly approved because someone was in a rush or already made a commitment to a vendor and they went and approved the project that wasn't ready. So, so with this technology, and then when the auditors come in, I'm not going to go take a sample of anything. And you're not going to do it. You're not going to need to do it. All you're going to do is make sure that that analytic was running during the time of the exposure and that if there were any management overrides, 
that they were properly approved, okay? Because I might say, you know, in this rods out on, you know, surfing in the Bahamas somewhere, so he's not available, so we're going to have Joe approve it instead, have Chris approve it instead, okay? Do you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying here? So, so the opportunity here is to take these very high-risk type things and automating. Now, one important point is, you know, you already have, you already said you pulled it out of an SAP system, and you were right, that's the approach, okay? You pull it out of an SAP system, so it's in there electronically. I don't need the freaking report, you know? I can just check against the SAP system. What you have to have, and this is where sometimes we break down, is the approvals are still signed pieces of paper. I don't have an automated approval. But workflow approvals, you can do with anything. They're simple. You know? and, and electronic signatures are legal in most countries. Okay? So I just put an elec electronic approval in SAP. It registers that as being approved, whether it's a journal entry or whatever. It's just a field. So all I'm checking is anything over $100,000 or any project, and do I have the right approval against a list of people that are uh, eligible to approve it, okay? You with me on that? And now the control is the test. So I don't have to send an army of auditors in. I know you guys are thinking, well, then what are the auditors going to do? They're going to look for fraud and the stuff we don't have time to do. Because, you know, this is, this is, you guys wrote, in the ACL homework you just did, you wrote more complicated things than this. It's simple to do. Why, why don't we do it? Why are, we, why are we not doing it? Linda, why aren't we doing it? Fear of change, culture? I don't know. That's the question I'm asking. I want to know. Okay? So, I, I was going to go into the tool, but in the interest, of, I was just show you our tool. But we have a tool now that does this, you know, that, 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 no, Again, I want to be clear, we don't have all this automated, but we have a tool that monitors all these controls and makes sure every company implements and does the testing for all these controls. It's more of a control management function, okay? All right, any questions about Sarbanes-Oxley and internal controls? Again, that's the world you guys are going to live in that go into auditing. And if you want to have fun doing it, don't do it the way we've been doing it for years. Let's change it, okay? Any, any, eh, take a segue into... Uh, into enterprise risk management. Again, this is the part of my job I love. I love doing this because it's so interesting. I'm involved in all these issues, worldwide issues, and you know, and I, and I love doing this. I can't talk a whole lot about our own risks, but I'll, I can talk in general about risks that most companies have right now. Probably the biggest one, interestingly, that almost all companies have is cyber terrorism and cyber security. Huge issue. And it's happening every day and there's targeted groups, 100,000 Chinese uh, black hats sanctioned by the government that are trying to break into, into infrastructure providers around the world. And in fairness, we do the same thing in the U.S., okay? So we're, it's, 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 it's a new kind of warfare, you know? There was, a, there was a virus called Stutnex. Anyone hear of that, Stutnex? It was a, it was a yeah, the Stutnex virus, yeah. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, yeah. And the way it did it is they had these things, it was, a, they have a moat around nuclear power plants so you can't get in. But what they did is there was an engineer who uh, they put this, they, he, he was on the internet and this virus got on from the internet. And, and the, 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 the speculation is that it was developed by uh, the U.S. government and Siemens and because it was our programmable logical controllers that got compromised in it. And what it did was, uh, and yeah, they, yeah, Israel was implicated. So, you know, these are worldwide issues. And what it did is it went into uh, centrifuges and uh, shut down over 1,000 centrifuges in a nuclear reprocessing factory. Now, can you, yeah, I mean, this is like warfare in a whole different realm, you know, it's, it's a whole different realm. But think about if someone were able to shut down the, say, the water flow system of a nuclear reactor. You could have uh, Fukushima all over again, you know, not because of a hurricane or a flood, but because of someone that knows how to get around and get through. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, and we have unbelievable security. You know, half the stuff I need to do for this class, I can't do because <laughs> I'm so, I got such a secure computer, you know, I can't run. I tried to load the oversight with Firefly, I can't run, load Firefly, I can't, I can't do all kinds of stuff. But it's, it's a very real threat, and it's, and it's, and it's both uh, in products, you know, like the, 
programmable logical controllers, and corporate and personal data. So you heard about the Target scandal, you know, and, and, and getting data out there. You're screwed if you, if you, if you, if you're, even your public domain data, like customer addresses and all that, that gets out from you and you can be, sh they can shut your business down, you know. I mean, Target almost went under over this thing, and many companies have gone under over it. So it's a, it's a huge issue. It's not just what you experience every day on your computer, but, and, and these are purposeful, you know, they, they have armies of people doing this, and I, I don't want to pick on China because there's other countries doing the same thing, you know. And, you know, the whole NSA scandal, right? What was that about? You know? So anyway, that, that's the kind of stuff. Now, how do you mitigate that risk? Or how do you leverage it as an opportunity? Maybe the opportunity is to come up with that software. It's probably a company that, got hacked, and we're, we're looking at that. How could we help companies, because we're an infrastructure provider and we develop software, how could we help companies figure out how to, how to avoid that? But that's probably one of the biggest risks. And then there's other sort of things that you might find interesting, you know, like, uh, you know, weather. Uh, you know, we had Sandy, we had Irene. Do you know that uh, uh, in, in the last decade, I saw this in some reinsurance data, the number of severe storms, not just hurricanes, but thunderstorms, tornadoes, et cetera, in North America is 10 times worse than it's been in any other decade. So, you know, and whether that's global warming or not, I don't know, but, you know, there's a trend that's really clear, and we're going to have more of this, you know, unless the trend changes, the ocean water's warming, the tide levels are rising, we're going to have more of these weather things. So what are you doing to mitigate risks around weather, you know, I mean, that's, that's another big one, you know, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, there's all these risks and they keep changing, and, and it's not just risks, and this is why I think Siemens has a great problem, we also look at opportunities, and that's the part I love, you know, what are the opportunities out there, because the race is to the swift, and if you don't get there first, you know, Kodak, again, they were, they were focused on digital film, they helped invent it, but they didn't get there, too. they got there too late, and they lost. And now, in technologies, technologies are changing so fast that you've got to get there first. And again, think about how can we use technology to monitor where we're at in getting there and where we're falling behind. The big one here in the United States is unconventional gas, this whole fracking thing. You haven't even seen the beginning of this. This is going to be huge. We're one of the largest, I mean, and there's, a, there's environmental concerns on, 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 you know, as well as opportunities that are really important to consider. But this thing is just beginning. This is going to be massive if, if the reserve things they are right. And it impacts everyone else. It impacts renewable energy, for example, because nobody's uh, going to put in windmills and solar panels if gas is dirt cheap. You know? I mean, and it has political implica implications for our relationship with Russia and the Ukraine and other places because we could sell, we can sell this natural gas. You know? So suddenly, now chemical companies are coming back to the U.S. for the first time in decades because there's cheap gas and they make chemicals out of mostly petroleum, you know? So, so the whole world is changing because of this stuff. And it's funny, I was at a wedding a couple weeks ago up in uh, the Marcellus Shale area in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know, I'm meeting these people that are overnight millionaires, and they had 1,200 acres of hunting uh, ground in, in the family for generations, and now they just sold the rights to 12 well, or six wells on that 1,200 acres. And they haven't even gotten paid. They got paid for selling the rights, but then they get a commission on every ounce of gas and, and uh, petroleum that comes out of that ground. These are like, you know, country farmers. They're going to be <laughs> freaking millionaires. I wish I, it's too late if you want to buy land. I wish I bought some, you know, bad land. And they don't even have to put the wells necessarily in their property. They can drill two miles uh, vertical drilling. That's what's so, you know, amazing about it. And, and it has challenges. You know, what's it doing to the environment? You know, are we going to have earthquakes because of it? I don't know. You know so. so these are some of the things that, that make enterprise risk management really interesting. And I want you to see the parallel here that we're using. We're saying, again, that, you know, we have that gross risk. We put in our internal controls for the, uh, the, to, the here, and then we get to our net risk, and then we put enterprise risk management in here. So it's all part of the same role of, uh, of impacting the risk model. So it's doing the same thing that's, that the controls you're doing are testing, except we're doing ones that we're not going to put controls in, but we're going to put we're going to put in we're going to start looking at these things. And here's my here's my thesis here is we need and there's some research going on here at Rutgers around this. We need to start using analytics to monitor risk, not just that we're uh, that we're not taking too much risk, but that we're taking enough risk that we're going into things that we should be going into. 
because a lot of companies are losing because of that. And what we do is we take a three-year look, okay? We want to see we want to see what's out there three years. You start getting five years, ten years, this idea of disruptive changes. Some of these things are further out than that, you know? And it's really fascinating because I work with our government affairs group and I work with our strategy group. And we, we, you know, and some things that you read in the newspaper, like we say things like, you know, the infrastructure in the U.S., the bridges, the roads, we, we need to spend $1.7 trillion on infrastructure. And we read that, you know, Obama's decided that we're going to, you know, put a bill in place that's going to, you know, fund the, to build all the bridges and the roads and, and everything. But what you, what you got to understand, and if you're on the inside of this from lobbyists and things like this, is, you know, that ain't going anywhere because we've got this gridlock in our Congress. So nothing's going to happen there. So that's not something we put on what we call our risk register necessarily until we see that it's really not just political, but that the money's on the table and something's going to happen. And that's huge because we got to spend money on infrastructure and mass transit and other things in the U.S. So, so this is really interesting stuff, and, it, and it's, it has a control implication to it, too. And again, uh, remember the COSO, this is called the COSO cube, and it tells you, see those four areas there of strategy operational reporting, and it tells you how to, you know, have an uh, ob objective set, that's your goal setting part I talked about, event identification, risk assessment, risk response, control activities, information communications, and then the monitoring of it. And, and you do it throughout your whole organization. That's called the COSO cube, developed by the Treadway Commission. That's what most of your internal control systems and enterprise risk management systems are based on. They're like a think tank and a research group. They do great work. And, and, and most of your big firms follow sort of the COSO model because it has, it's like the good housekeeping seal. It has credibility to it, okay? So, Again, we're only going to do, just like we only have controls, we only have enterprise risks and opportunities linked to business objectives. If you don't, if you have something not linked to a business objective, don't waste your time doing it. You shouldn't be bothered doing it. Same approach as that PCMB, that control environment. We look at risks as strategic risk, operational, financial, and compliance, okay? And this for the same reason, because your biggest value loss is right here. This is where you want to have... Uh, analytics to address risk. Okay, and then we, we do things for, you know, prompting. You know, think when you're thinking about risks, we do it top down. So we go to our CEOs. I meet with all the CEOs and CFOs every month or every quarter at least. And I say, okay, what's keeping you awake at night? You know, what do you, what, what, what do you think? What could go wrong in your business? What could go wrong at Siemens? And then we look at economic developments, things that are going on in, in the economy. Things that are going on politically, you know, in instability in Russia and the Middle East and all these kind of things, and how are they going to impact our business? And things like conflict minerals, okay? We look at customers and markets. What are our competitors doing? You know, what is, uh, you know, technical developments, new technologies, okay? And we look at our internal control system. Where did we have deficiencies? If we had deficiencies around internal, uh, around financial reporting, maybe we've got, we've got a, uh, put a risk up there that we've got a problem with our financial reporting, and then we and we see that sometimes we have issues we got to deal with in financial reporting. Okay, and this is uh, what's called uh, kind of a heat map. Okay, and what it is is uh, we look at likelihood and impact. Okay, and they call this a heat map. I'll show you another example of it. And this is from the corporate uh, executive board. I'm, I'm we're members of the corporate executive board risk council. Love this group. They do. They just do research. Now, Ernst and Young does research. Deloitte and Touche does research. I think these guys do the best research out there they're, because it's it's it's. They're not trying to sell you anything. They're just a think tank. And so this is from March of 2011. But you know, this is where you know these are the things where where you don't want to be is out here where it's a high impact and a high likelihood. Now later on we're going to talk about T and E. Think about travel and entertainment expense. That's a a, low, a, a high likelihood, because it's happening, guarantee it, but it's a lower impact. It doesn't have as big a, uh, an impact. So you can see in this case, and then we talk about velocity of risks. Now think about velocity as how fast is this coming at me, okay? Is this in my face? Is this something I need to worry about now? The velocity of uh, infrastructure, you know, opportunity, money being spent on infrastructure in the U.S. is kind of slow right now because nobody has any money, you know? Um, although there are ways to do it. 
the velocity of uh, a lawsuit that might take five years is very slow. Okay? But the velocity of things like uh, you know, the Russian-Ukraine situation right now and how that impa impacts your business, that's happening now. You've got to move now on that. So that's what the dots mean. The red ones, at this time, commodity prices were real big. Talent risk. That's, uh, you know, I'm a member of the baby boomer generation, 80 million strong, starting in, uh, born between 1947 and 1964. They're retiring at the rate now, just started really, of 12,000 a day, okay? Now, they didn't retire because, you know, uh, the economy sucks so bad, you know, that everyone's saying, I'm not retiring, you know? But now, if the economy gets better, you're going to see these people going out fast. There's a huge talent drain. And it's good for you guys because you get jobs, but some of these people are people who know how to run 100, billion, 100 million dollar you know, projects and they're gone. And you can't bring someone out of the MBA program in Rutgers and have them run a 100 million dollar project in, uh, in renewable energy and they've never done it before. You know, I think you guys can do it and with technology you'll be able to do it. But, so there's talent loss is a, big, is a big risk that we haven't seen really come to fruition yet, but it's starting, okay? Uh, recessionary pressures, M&A risk, fraud, uh, you know. But this was just what their customers said. And there's an interesting guy named Daniel Sharp from Harvard, and he says, you know, one of the problems with, with my job with enterprise risk management, if you start talking and trying to predict disasters, like we're going to have another Sandy probably next year, or it's going to be the year after, don't try and predict disasters. Try and observe trends, okay? So the things that happen with the financial collapse, with the real estate bubble, with the corruption that happened at Siemens, okay? Were there not indicators, were there not trends that we could have been monitoring to see that? You know, the, 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 the Enron situation with special purpose entities and stuff. Are there, were there not, you know, well, let's take the real estate boom issue, you know, or, or, or this idea of uh, credit swaps, you know? I mean, weren't, weren't there things that we saw we could have seen, and if we would have monitored the trends, we could have predicted at some point something was going to go wrong. But instead, we had this, uh, what did uh, Greenspan call it, this uh, uh, enthusiastic exuberance or something. We were all caught up in it. We were all drinking the Kool-Aid and just going with everyone else and thinking this, could n this, this, uh, this gravy train will never end. You know? So he says, don't, because you're going to lose credibility if you start saying, you know, we are going to have another financial collapse by 2014. Or 2018, because you you know you, you may be right, you may be wrong, but there's there's analytics, there's there's uh, uh, trends that I can monitor, and I can use technology to monitor to see where this thing is going, and that's why good investment people know this. They know what those trends are, and they monitor them. You know, so um, yeah, so so this is this is what we call a heat map, and. You know, here is here's where one of the most dangerous parts is uh, is uh, the the low li no over here low likelihood. This area here is one of the most dangerous parts, and it's where we find a thing called black swans. Those are the things like Enron, like WorldCom, like the financial collapse. Those are things that are high impact but very low likelihood. We couldn't imagined that we were going to go into a recession like we did in 2007. It was it wasn't on anybody's radar. You know, and what are the things that aren't on our radar today that are going to happen? You know, I mean, it, it, and they're going to happen. So let talk about a black swan for a minute. Uh, I was going to have actually draw one here, but I just suffice it to say, you know, how do you, how do you find a black swan? And that's what I'm talking about here. You got it. You got to find a trend. Okay, you got to find the trends that are leading to the problem. And you know, those credit default swaps. Did I show you that credit default swap study? the credit default swaps, you can actually see as more and more companies are doing these credit default swaps, the risk is much higher. And you could, you, you actually go back and look at prior data and you could predict the issues in Venezuela and, uh, and some of these other countries that are really struggling now because their, their credit, because of their credit issues. So we can look for trends. In the real estate market, you know, this, this, uh, all this, the loaning that was going on and the, and the boom, the, you know, there, there, there were, there's trends in there. We could have been monitoring to see that. Enron, special purpose entities and, and slush funds and that kind of thing. So, I mean, um, if I asked you today, you know, do you think there's black swans out there that we don't know about? Anybody, anybody, anything? What keeps you guys awake at night when you, when you, uh, 
think about, yeah, wh what? <laughs> Midterms, yeah, yeah. Now, is that a black swan? No, not really, because you, we, we know about that, right? That's a, that's a high impact, high likelihood, because it's going to happen. Yeah. So. Now, is there, is there something in going on in the world that, uh, this is just, there's no right answer to this, but is there something going on in the world today that really keeps you guys, that you, you think uh, really scares you? In Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm looking forward to some inflation because I have some investments that earn nothing. You know, I'd love to get, uh, uh, I remember the days we used to get 8, 10, 12 percent return on our money, you know, and now you can't get a, a half a percent. So, but you guys don't want inflation because it'll price you right out of everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, think about yourselves. You kind of have a, and I'm going to talk in a minute about a concept called risk appetite that's really interesting. But you guys, you guys have risks that you're thinking about. You know, what's, what's, what's going to happen to the job market? You know, what's going to happen to, uh, you know, the politically? Or, or are we going to war with, uh, with uh, you know, in Iraq again? Are we going to send our, you know, uh, men and women back into Iraq to fight a war over there? I don't know. But, you know, those, those are the things you ought to think about. And you ought to think about in your own life, you know, how do I mitigate risks and how do I leverage opportunities? Because you all have opportunities too. You guys have your MBAs from a great school, you know, and uh, you, you, maybe some of you have a job, some of you don't, but you want, it, you want to find the, the right job. But is that where you're going to stay? Is that, is, you know, what, what, do you, what do you want to do? Is there an opportunity to move ahead and do something? And, and you, should, you should actually stop and think about that. You know, what, what, what are the risks and opportunities that I have in my life and how am I going to manage those risks? Because it's not about avoiding risks. It's about managing risks, because risks are here. And, and actually, you should be taking, like I said earlier, and I, I, I talk to a lot of you know, people, because I do this recruiting stuff for Siemens, and I, I, I tell a lot of people, they're saying, oh, I'm not sure I want to take this job over in wherever, Germany or whatever. And that's a personal decision. But a lot of times, I'll say to them, you know, if you're ever going to do it, do it now. Because you know, now you, you can take a little risk. And if it doesn't work out, you can. You know, you just have your apartment and a few things, and you can move on to something else. And it's okay to, to you know, I, I told you earlier, I, I, I went on a startup company. Huge risk. I had two kids and, and, and my wife. Moved up to a hotel in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I didn't get paid for a year. Worked my butt off for, for a year. But I was doing some fascinating things. I was setting up insurance captives, and I was setting up a IPO preparation and doing all this stuff that I don't do today. You know, it was really setting up uh, pro formas and uh, going out and raising capital and uh, with, with high net worth people from Dubai and Australia. I was doing all this cool stuff. And, uh, you know, but it was a great, and I didn't get paid for a year, but what a great experience, you know. And, and you know, fortunately, I didn't mortgage my house like some people did and, you know, and everything else. And, uh, and, and it worked out okay. I ended up doubling my salary when I came out of it. So, you know. If you have a little risk, then you know you take a little risk sometimes, you know. And uh, so what we do now with uh, enterprise risk management is the same thing here that we did with the controls. So we have a financial impact. So we look at a risk and say, okay, if this risk has more than a $250 million pre-tax, and it, this depends on the particular organization within Siemens, so it could be more or less. This is just an example. So if it's less than, you know, if it's less than 10 million, we may not even talk about it as an enterprise level risk, okay? And, uh, and then we also look at business objectives. Is it going to affect one of the business objectives? Media, regulatory bodies, management time. Same kind of things I talked about before, you know. It, it could be that conflict minerals and 12 people standing in front of your headquarters saying that you're abusing human rights in the Congo is going to be a lot more detrimental to your company than, uh, than a maybe a hundred million dollar, uh, you know, financial restatement or something. So, you know, and I, by the way, feel strongly that we really need as, as companies and you need personally to be involved and, and care about those things, human rights and civil rights and other things, you know, and, 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 and being a good citizen in your community. You know, I go out regularly on, uh, we call them caring hands days and we go up to the you know, the Bowery in New York, and we paint the building, and we help, uh, you know, places do things. So do that kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's important, you know, because otherwise a corp corporation becomes an impersonal entity. And I know the big four do a lot of that stuff, benevolent type things, you know. 
Okay? And then for opportunities, we only look at business objectives and financial impact. Okay? So we're not going to do an opportunity that you know, is going to be a regulatory violation or something or a regulatory advantage. You know? um, and then we use likelihood and we use this kind of scale. And again, some companies do the same thing, some companies do things different, but the likelihood of a nine is a 90% chance of happening. A likelihood of a five is a 50% chance of it happening within three years of realizing it. So we're looking at both impact and likelihood. And this is interesting, so I, I don't put the actual risks up here because I, I can't really show you them, but this is, this is what we have. This is on a heat map of impact and likelihood, and this is where our risks fall, our major risks, say for the US or for whatever, whatever one we're doing, okay? And notice that when we talk about risks, that financial and compliance make up the bulk of the risk. These are the four categories, strategy, operations, financial, and compliance. Financial and compliance make up the biggest bulk of the risks, but when we go over to the opportunities, it's strategy and operations are impacted the most by the opportunities. And you'd kind of expect that because when I'm dealing with risks, we tend to just think about financial things, although we got to do a better job of thinking about other things. But when we talk about opportunities, we're talking about how do I grow my business, how do I do business objectives, okay? And then this is just that the impact scales again, okay? So now I want to talk to you about a new concept before we do a, a break here, 9, 10, 1030. How, how are we holding up? Gut check. Is this making sense? Are you getting this? Okay, I'm just taking the inside, you know, this is what I do for a living, you know. So I chase cat, mouse, mice. So, um, so this is a new concept in enterprise risk management that I think you ought to know about because, and think about personally too, because, you know, one of the challenges that we have is we have risks and opportunities, say, at Siemens, okay? And I'm sitting in a room with Kevin and Chris and uh, Matilda, and we're the management team, and we're trying to decide if Siemens has a risk in this area or if we should, if we should take a risk, okay? And we all have a certain appetite for risk, you know. Me personally, I'm a risk taker. I, I you know, if, and my wife is very much risk adverse. So we kind of meet in the middle and it works out okay. If we did everything I want to do, I would be, that's why I took the job I didn't get paid for for a year and I did all kinds of other stuff. I made investments that I lost $100,000 on, you know, I mean, so, and by the way, a, a, a wise Indian businessman told me once, until you lose $100,000 in business, you'll never be great at business. So if you, if you lose some money, it's okay, you know, you'll, 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 you'll recover. But, um, you know, so, but we sit in a room and we're making decisions about, for, for Siemens, for a company, about risk but we all have different risk levels. So I may say, you know, gee, let's go buy that company, you know? And uh, Matilda may say, no, Rod, I wouldn't buy that company, you know? But, but or, or we may all be like Rod and say, hey, let's all buy that company. Yeah, great idea, let's go buy it. When Siemens wouldn't buy that company, or it's not a good decision, we just happen to have a whole bunch of risky people in the room at the time. So what this idea is, is that companies begin, and I've worked with IBM and General Electric and the corporate executive board on this concept, you know, of how do we start to define our risk appetite, and then using the technology we're teaching in this class, how do we measure our risk appetite, okay? So think about your own risk appetite. How many in here would say they're big risk takers? Setting a communication, okay, so enterprise risk management clearly aligns with strategy, define risk appetite for each organization. So what, what, what we're getting at here is how do you define a risk appetite for a company? You have some kind of risk appetite, but what's, what would be a risk appropriate risk appetite for a company to have, you know? And, and you really need to understand that because it isn't Matilda and Rod making a decision about what Siemens ought to do, it's what Siemens wants to do. So here's how you go about doing that. Again, I said, it's, this is an example from a company called Hydro um, One. And what they did is they took their, their objectives. So one objective was top line growth, one was profit, profitability, one was compliance, one was reputation, and one was operational excellence. And like I said, in every company, you want to have those five things, not 450 things, that are important to your business. And if you can't define what those five to 10 things are, then you probably aren't clear about your strategy and you're probably not going to accomplish it. You know, if you go in a company and they show you their strategy document, it's 450 pages and there's no summary to it, it's going to be a problem. And I guarantee you they're not going to rally the troops around it, okay? So then what you do 
is you say to yourself, okay, our risk appetite, and this is done, say, at the board of directors, is that for top-line growth, we are a company that, I'm just using this as an example, that we want to grow this business, and we're willing to take risks to grow this business, okay? Profit, we're, we, we're, we'll take some risk, but we want a return of 15% on net income, okay? We want, that's the return we want. Compliance, we have almost, this is five means you're really risky, one or negative one or zero means you're not risky at all. Compliance, we're going to take little, if any, risk at all, okay? Now, you may say you don't take any risk in compliance at all, un unacceptable. I actually said that earlier in compliance, but really that's not true because if you think about it, let's take safety as an example. Safety is a top priority in manufacturing, but we're not, and you may spend a million dollars on a safety program but you're probably not going to spend $20 million to make it a little bit better, okay? So you have some, some tolerance for safety risk. Reputation, I'm going to take very little risk, and operational excellence, very, very less risk, okay? So what I might say here is show me every opportunity that has a 15% return, and we're going to go after that company aggressively. And we may win some, and we may lose some. But if, if, they, if, if we go after those companies, they've got to have at least a 15% return, okay? So... So then what you do is you say to yourself, okay, a five means we'll take justified risks, uh, we, we'll accept the uncertainties, we'll, we'll, we'll choose options with the highest return accepting possible failure. So I'm willing to accept failure because I've got to grow my company. I've got to get into decentralized energy or unconventional gas or, 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 or whatever. I want to get into those things. And uh, how willing is Siemens or whatever company to trade off this objective against achieving others? So with that growth objective, I may say I'm a five. That means I'm willing to not get the profit all the time in order to make that goal. Okay, I'm willing to take risk there. I'm going to I'm going to put I'm going to roll the dice on this a little bit. All right. And then adverse means I avoid risk is a core thing, extremely low tolerance, and I'll never take a risk here that's going to affect the rest of the business. And then what you do is you, you, you turn this into, uh, uh, into a, uh, uh, well, first you turn it into a risk appetite statement. That's a statement of what we're willing to do and not do. And then you build risk tolerances around it. And that means these are the parameters. So this is sort of an example of that. So uh, here. So here's my top line growth example, okay? So ABC company, and this is actually Hydro One or whatever, reaching a 100 million sales milestone, ABC will only invest in core businesses consistent with identified megatrends in energy or sustainability. Achieving top-line profitable growth in all core business sectors is an important strategic objective where a ABC is willing to assume risk and the possibility of failure. An actual risk appetite greater than desired risk appetite we took too much risk in this area last year and we lost margin, whatever. So here, I'm willing to take risks here. I'm willing to put other objectives at risk in order to grow my business because I know I got to grow my business. Think about a software company, right? If you're a software company, you better, you better be growing constantly or you're obsolete in a year, okay? Where if you're a bank, what do you think your risk appetite's going to be at a bank? It's going to be a little more conservative because if you're out, you know, doing derivatives and... Uh, and debenture issues and all these other high risk things, you might have a problem, you know. And 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 so uh, so I'm in each of these things. So in profit, I say, you know, I'm going to take a 12 percent, you know, anything with a 12 percent margin that meets my growth opportunities. We're going to go do, and we're going to grow the heck out of this. Compliance, I'm saying, uh, I have zero tolerance for regulatory compliance violations. Like I said, you really don't have zero. You have something, you know, uh, some you have some appetite for it and reputation and operational excellence. So, so I actually write a statement, a risk appetite statement, and I'm clear about what that is, and then I put risk tolerances on. And then I measure my, uh, I measure my tolerances. So I want to see not just am I taking risks I shouldn't, but am I taking enough risk to grow my business by you know 15% or whatever my goal was. And, and some good companies do things, and, and, and we're not here yet on this. You know, we're, we're, we're just looking at using analytics to start to do this. I want to be up front there. But other companies are doing it. And in fact, I think Lockheed Martin is doing some things, and he'll, he'll talk a little bit about that. But now I can measure, if I have a growth objective of 15%, I can measure my key indicators, key KRIs, key risk indicators, 
And am I getting to that 15% component? And am I, am I getting close to that? And I can measure, and if I'm not, then I'm going to go back to people and say, Matilda, you need to take more risk. Uh, you, you're not taking enough risk. And, and so get out and buy some more things. Because that's the biggest danger is we fall behind. You know, that's, that's, that, you, you might have a, a deal go bad, but if you fall behind on getting into digital film of your Kodak or uh, unconventional gas of your Siemens or GE or someone else, you miss that opportunity and you may be out of business. And you ever see the statistics on how many of the Fortune 5 today are, were Fortune 5 20 years ago? You know, there's lots of people, have, lots of really good companies that were really well managed, that did financial accounting really well. They're not here anymore because they miss these things. And these, these are the most important things for your business. And you guys as financial people, your job is not to crunch numbers and produce financial reports. It's to be advisors to the business about this kind of stuff too. You know. So um, what we do is we risk appetite achieves expectations by limiting excessive risk and triggering communication with key stakeholders. So now I'm sitting in a room and I have a risk appetite statement that tells me what my risk appetite is for that company and I have tolerances and metrics that I'm going to evaluate them on. Now I can make a decision on behalf of Siemens and its objectives and not on behalf of Rod and Matilda and James and Chris and others because we may have a different comp combined risk appetite. You know? But I, I think it's a cool concept to think about in your personal life too. You know, that again, you have some kind of you know, things you want to obtain in your objectives and you have some type of aversion to risk or some type of risk appetite for taking risk. And there may be a disconnect. You know, you might want to take your career here, but you're really not willing to take risks that you need to take. And if you're not, you, you ought to think about that because you're not going to get here if you don't take risks. You know, life is about taking, taking risks, calculated risks, you know, and, and, and seizing opportunities, okay? So, uh, it creates a culture where you're clear about what the risk is and then you document the risk appetite and it doesn't mean it doesn't change over time because it's going to change, you know, the, the, the environment's going to change and the amount of risk you're willing to take is going to change, okay? So then, uh, how do you implement it? You link the organizational strategies to objectives. It's got to be linked to objectives, just like internal controls and enterprise risk management, excuse me. And again, start with the with manageable set of common strategic objectives, because some companies don't know what their objectives are. Do you guys personally know what your objectives are? If I asked you to uh, write out what you're going to be doing, what is your vision? A vision is a compelling picture of a preferable future. What you're doing five years from now, could you guys articulate that for me? Do you, no, just, just not, do you think you could? I'm not going to ask you to tell us. That's a personal thing. But do you think you could articulate what you're doing? And Tara, in, in five years? Yeah. Okay, you have a vision. And I encourage you this, write the vision down. Uh, I, I worked with a guy from uh, um, named Paul Bullion who did the turnaround for Pratt & Whitney, and he showed us this little four-term model for uh, achieving a vision. And what he showed us was that you put out on the right-hand side your goals and your, uh, your, your goals and your vision for five, two to five years down the road. What is Chris going to be doing two to five years from now? and then you write it down. And then you go up here and you look at the ground. The ground is where am I today? So if Rod said, I want to be the President of the United States by 2016, and we say Rod works in Siemens, he teaches at Rutgers, you know, fat chance, right? So I, I got to change my, so you do a gap, you look at the ground today, where are you today? Financially, you know, career-wise, what, what, where are you? Could you get to this vision? You do a gap analysis, and you adjust the vision if you can't get there to be something you can get to, okay? Then you look down below here at your will and energy or your motivation, because even though you could do something and it fits a vision you have, are you really up to it? You know, do you have the, the will and energy to do it, or are you just, is it a pipe dream for you? And are you willing to make the sacrifices that it takes to do it, like completing an MBA program here at Rutgers, okay? And then on the left side, you put your goals. And your goals are, what am I going to do now in order to get to that vision this year? And you write all this down. It's really important you write it down. My wife and I do this in our, in our family. And uh, the things that we've written down, we've gotten done, whether it's savings, buying property, paying off mortgages, doing something benevolent, whatever it is. Okay? The things we've never written down we've, that we said someday I'm going to, we never got to. 
So, so think about where you want to be in five years, write down, and then the goals are what I'm going to do this year. Maybe I got to get my degree, maybe I got to get my CPA, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. And it doesn't mean the vision doesn't change, but you know, it can change, and that's okay. But it gives you a mooring, it gives you somewhere where you're heading, it gives you a statement of direction. And we do that in companies. You know, we set a statement of direction. This is where we're going. It might change two years from now or a year from now, but at least I, I, I got a direction that I'm working towards. So, so think about that. Uh, you know, linking linking it to goals. But you got to. My point is, you got to be able to articulate your vision. It can't be you know a 40-page document because that's not a vision. Okay. Gradually build on the initial successes. Continuous improvement. Consider trade-offs and building a consensus. Make sure everyone agrees on that risk appetite, okay? And again, that's the, where the opportunity is. I just want to cover a couple other myths. One is that, you know, all risks are legal and financial. That's not true. I gotta give you a break here. The next, the, the other one is, you know, because we're good at risk management, uh, we've invested in enterprise risk management, everything must be great. But let me tell you this, if you're not managing risks, if you're just coming up with risks, that's a lot of fun. But then what is the plan that I'm going to do to mitigate those risks? And what kind of analytics, that's what this course is about, am I going to put in place to measure whether I'm achieving those risks or not? Because it's great to say, you know, cyber terrorism is a problem, but, you know, Angela, what are you doing about it? What are you, what are you doing in your company about cyber terrorism? If what you're saying is, oh, this could never happen to us. You know, that's what Target said. And that's what the NSA said and everybody else that's been dealing with it, you know. And who knows how many of those go on. So, so it's important that we manage the risk. Um, yeah, uh, this is just the idea that some people are really good at it just with projects, okay? But they're not good at it as a company. So you might be good at managing risks around your financial portfolio, but you're not managing it around your life, you know? And your financial portfolio is not your life, all right? And so these are other areas, failing to link ERM to strategy, ERM lacks clear value proposition, little substance to a risk appetite. ERM maturity raises possibility of compliance, shift the focus of risk monitoring, limited assurance integration. So for example, with my job, one of my challenges is to make sure that I hook up with the strategy people and that we work together on things and they don't see me as a threat to them because I'm coming from an, or a duplication to them. You know? And I got to work with our government affairs group that are doing lobbying, you know. And sometimes some of these issues are so sensitive that they don't want to tell me that, that we have a problem in this particular area, you know. But it's important that I know as an officer of the company that I am aware of what the risks are for Siemens or I can't help manage it. And what I tell people is I say, you know, you get, you give me these risks and opportunities and I'm going to get you focus and resources because I meet, I just had my meeting last week with the top management of Siemens, and we go over these risks. And we have the CEO, the CFO, the head of HR, the uh, chief counsel, and, 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 and so I have the ear of them, and I can say, you know, we're supposed to be going after this opportunity or mitigating this risk, and we got three job openings that no one's filling, and these guys have no money to do this. So I'm getting people to rally around, you know, uh, uh, we want to use risk management to get things done in the company. You know, so. Okay, so questions, comments. You see the connection? We got, we got a risk world. We put internal controls in, okay? And then we put in enterprise risk management for the things we don't cover with internal controls. And then we assume some amount of risk. So we're not going to uh, address all risk. And in, in, in uh, enterprise risk management, it's not just risk, it's opportunities too. We're looking at what are the opportunities. And all of these things have metrics that we can apply to them. And like we talked about in the last classes, we want to use the same system to develop the metrics, the ACL or the oversight or whatever system we, or an in-house system, whatever system we use, we want to use the same system and the same database to cover key risk indicators, to cover SOA controls, to cover any type of controls because I can, I can write these analytics in the same tool and I can cover all business processes, strategy, operational, financial, and compliance.